Hello and welcome to IELTS TV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porus, and I'm Natasha Kircha. Coming up in today's newscast, Prime Minister Netanyahu unveils yet another secret Iranian nuclear site. Polls ahead of next week's elections come with a few surprises of their own. And the Israeli national baseball team advances towards the 2020 Olympic qualifiers. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu is making more bold accusations this week. He's exposing yet another alleged secret nuclear site located in central Iran. And while the Prime Minister isn't going into too many details regarding what experiments were performed there, he does claim that it was used to conduct nuclear weapons testing. Netanyahu also claims to have learned about the site through the nuclear archives that Israel raided from Tehran last year. But after seeing that Israel had found the facility, Netanyahu says Tehran abandoned it and destroyed the evidence. Today we reveal that uh, yet another secret nuclear site was exposed in the archives that we brought from uh, Tehran. In this site, Iran conducted experiments to develop nuclear weapons. This is the site near Abadeh, south of Isfahan. When Iran realized that we uncovered this site, here's what they did. They destroyed the site. They just wiped it out. Well, Netanyahu's claims appear to be corroborated, too. Israeli Channel 12 news analyst Eud Ya'ari notes that the secret nuclear facility in Abadeh was among the largest air defense facilities Iran built in the past seven years. And it's just a stone's throw away from Iran's Natanz uranium enrichment plant and the yellow cake production site in Isfahan. Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif, on the other hand, says that Netanyahu is just looking for war, tweeting that, quote, the, the possessor of real nukes cries wolf on an alleged demolished site in Iran. And meanwhile, political rival Benny Gantz from the Blue and White Party is blasting Netanyahu for using sensitive security intelligence for cheap political points ahead of elections. But politically motivated or not, all of the evidence still seems to point towards Iran lying. Zarif has not addressed in his response what the site was, nor why it appears to have been demolished. And the IAEA has also confirmed on Monday that Iran was in fact installing advanced centrifuges, the third official breach of the JCPOA, just days after finding traces of uranium at the last site that Israel exposed. Prime Minister Netanyahu therefore ended his revelation by calling on the international community to continue exerting sanctions and pressures on Tehran. This is what I have to say to the tyrants of uh, Tehran. Israel knows what you're doing. Israel knows when you're doing it. And Israel knows where you're doing it. We will continue to expose your lies. What we see is a consistent pattern of Iranian lies, deception, and violations. I call on the international community to wake up, to realize that Iran is systematically lying. And I call on the international community to join President Trump's sanctions to exert more pressure on Iran. And now for more on Netanyahu's latest Iran revelation, please welcome senior security and military analyst and candidate for Knesset for the Israel Beitenu party, Colonel Olivier Rafowitz. Colonel, thank you so much for coming in again. Thank you. All right, so first of all, you know, why is this revelation so important? Uh, you know, because we all know, thanks in large part to Netanyahu, how dangerous Iran is and what they've been up to. First of all, I mean, I would like to say that we are right now in a very harsh uh, political campaign for Knesset. And it's very uh, strange that at this level of uh, information, Prime Minister is actually revealing what we think or we uh, assume that it's very, very high secret uh, information. and. Uh, Many questions have been raised uh, because of this uh, way out to reveal such information. Of course, it's very important to explain to the world that Iran is actually rushing for getting the atomic bomb and uh, what is going on there is very dangerous. But is it the right timing to do it? Is it the right way to reveal such information during the campaign? Many questions have been raised and uh, maybe you're going to ask me. More, well, perhaps. yeah, okay, so that's, that's where kind of the response comes into to this picture. You know, are there any European nations that are now seeing this specific revelation as a sign of, okay, maybe we need to, to get more involved? You know, there's something new that needs to take place here? 
Listen, uh, till now, uh, in spite of so many uh, information that has been already given to uh, the different uh, agencies in Europe and in the world, many European countries, among them France, are trying to appease the uh, situation with Iran in order to bring back Iran to the uh, community of the right nations, so-called. Mm -hmm. So to give today more information, of course, is very important. But your question is also very important. Is it enough to change the, the, the uh, uh, situation vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran? I'm not sure, because uh, in the same case, in the same timing, Mr. Trump, president of the USA, is also talking about a new uh, meeting with the Iranian president. Uh, well, which they, Tehran seems to be saying yeah, is not going to be happening, right? Yeah but, um, yeah, but I mean, there is some kind of diplomatic uh, uh, opening and uh, we are still in Israel continuing to give more information, to reveal more information, to raise its uh, appearing that it is very important to give information in order to do something. But to do something right now appears that the European countries, mostly France and uh, uh, Germany, are trying to stop the move and even trying to influence, to convince the American not to go uh, uh, too far with Iran. So altogether, we have the risk to be a little bit alone. And to be right. alone in such a situation is not good. And maybe the way to do it is not good. Maybe it's good to do it uh, under the table and on, not on the and table. Not in such a public uh, yeah. way. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Meanwhile, in the south, the IDF confirms that an Israeli copter-style drone was lost overnight in Gaza. And Palestinian sources report that Hamas now has possession of the UAV after shooting it down over Rafah in the southern Gaza Strip. Similarly, this latest lapse in surveillance follows another downed IDF drone in Lebanon over the weekend. Hezbollah militants claim to have shot the drone down, while the IDF says that it was conducting surveillance. Then two weeks ago, Hezbollah claims to have fired upon three other Israeli drones in Lebanon just days after allegedly Israeli UAVs fell down over Beirut. And finally, in July, back in the south, another recon drone crashed in central Gaza, although Gaza reports that it was shot down by a terror group. Either way, it looks like Israel's unmanned activities have been ramping up in recent weeks, despite the many risks, such as how many of the IDF's smaller UAVs actually have a pretty high crash frequency. Their size and simple design apparently make them easy to fail, get shot, or caught up in obstacles. Well, the foreign ministry is being forced to freeze diplomatic activities around the world, and it's all due to budget constraints. The finance ministry's accountant general gave the instruction due to the, quote, grave deficit in the ministry's budget and diplomats working overseas, new initiatives and hosting delegations, and journalists from abroad are now all completely halted. The foreign ministry is calling this intervention by the finance ministry unprecedented and says that at a time when Israel is dealing with the threat of Iran and its proxies, the foreign ministry and its missions abroad will be almost entirely paralyzed. Foreign Minister Israel Katz says he's working to solve the crisis, but financial troubles at the foreign ministry are nothing new, and the ministry has blamed them on consistent underfunding by the Treasury. Now, this latest decision by the finance ministry comes just two months after it signed a deal with the foreign ministry to provide a significant increase in its budget and divert a planned strike that would have shut down Israeli missions in different countries every day. This agreement was reached following a huge cut of 1.2 billion shekels, or 333 million U.S. dollars, to the budget in June. And additionally, in May, the state comptroller issued a report detailing that ambassadors and staff had been living abroad on assignment in uninhabitable conditions, some envoys in rat-infested dwellings and sleeping on mattresses on the floor. Well, joining us now in the studio for more ahead of next week's election, we have political analyst and chairman of the O Zionist Foundation, Zohar Tal. Thank you so much for joining us. So let's first talk about Netanyahu. What are the chances that, you know, we're going to see Netanyahu becoming the next prime minister? Yeah, well, as you put very nicely, uh, it's a matter of numbers, of, uh, of voting percentage. And uh, if we will see the, the numbers getting lower and lower, uh, he will have a problem because uh, it will probably play into the hands of blue-white. If we see high uh, voting percentage, uh, then Netanyahu will probably be the next prime minister. By the way, it is opposite to what usually happens when the, the uh, party in uh, government is, uh, doesn't need a high percentage of uh, mm -hmm. voting in order to do that. Well, also, Otsma Yehudit is now, mm -hmm. you know, they passed the threshold, so that's a whole different 
obstacle? Yeah, well, that's another big question. I think there's a there's a large question mark uh, question mark above this. Uh, Otsma does pass in the polls. I find it hard to believe that it will, we will actually see them uh, passing in the real uh, okay. in the real ballots. Do you think that uh, you know the right wing or the or the Likud at least in order to become uh, the next you know coalition forming party? Do you think that they need Otsma Yehudit? Yes, definitely, because uh, we are at a stalemate. Uh, Otsma Yehudit getting into the parliament, into the Knesset, means two more seats for the right wing and uh, two less seats for the left wing. A total of four seats can do the whole thing and they uh, can change the map. If those, those seats might not come from another right wing party? Yeah, well, uh, w when they pass because of the system, if they do not pass, the, these four seats, four uh, virtual seats, will split between left and right. right. So either Likud will get it or, or other sure. right-wing party. But if they do get in, then they will get four seats uh, that will, two of them will be subtracted from the left-wing parties. Now, Gantz, uh, he mentioned a few days ago that he is aiming to have a more secular coalition. What are the chances of that actually happening, given the numbers that we're seeing here? Yeah, well, uh, with these numbers, if Otsma passes, I don't see him standing a chance to do that. Um, if uh, Otsma doesn't pass, he might be able to do that. Um, a unity government, I think, at this point is out of the question. Mm -hmm. No one will uh, will uh, will declare he will go in that direction. I mean, I think that's and a question that we just have gotten yeah. sick of asking. Will there yeah. be a unity government? <laughs> the answer is the same yeah. every single yeah. time. Unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, however, forming a government uh, with the support of the Arab party is possible, again, uh, with Lieberman's support, of course. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So well, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, okay. thanks for having me. Now, moving on, New York City has the largest population of Jews outside of Israel. In fact, with around 1.1 million people, Jews account for about 13% of the city's 8.5 million person population. Yet despite remaining a clear minority, the New York City Police Department told CNN this week that more than half of the hate crimes reported this year have been anti-Semitic in nature. Thankfully though, as opposed to violence, the incidents in New York are mostly acts of vandalism, like graffiti and swastikas sprayed onto synagogues. But still, in 2019, anti-Semitic hate crimes were up 63% in comparison to last year, with 152 reports this year over 93 in 2018. And while the NYPD's chief detective Dermot Shea says that in many cases mental health is to blame, in other cases, some people just hate. While on August 30th, Mayor de Blasio tweeted that he wouldn't tolerate hate or violence against the Jewish community anymore. And with that in mind, though, outside of New York City, anti-Semitism can still be felt. In Minnesota, for one, the historic Adas Israel synagogue in the city has just been set ablaze, and only parts of its main structure still stand. Then, moving across the ocean to Barcelona, we see similarities here as well, as on Wednesday, the synagogue to the Jewish community who were badly beaten outside of a nightclub in Warsaw, Poland, early Saturday morning. The group had been living abroad there for a semester of university, and two were hospitalized after being attacked by what the victims described as a, quote, Arabic-speaking group of men, who also yelled out Free Palestine and other profanities ahead of their assault. The new Netflix miniseries The Spy, starring Sasha Baron Cohen, has just aired, and it tells the incredible life story of the famed Israeli spy Eli Cohen. But some critics in Israel are saying that the show has ignored a lot of important events details and even lacks creativity. Well, joining us with more of the details is ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh. But first, let's take a look at the trailer. Let's have an open, honest conversation on what my husband does. Thinking of the clothes, he doesn't work anymore. I can't put him away. Kamel isn't real. That life isn't real. You are Eli Cohen. You need to remember that. It's a bit late for that. Hey guys, so I just wanted to really quickly give a recap of the show for those who haven't heard of the series, The Spy. The Netflix series tells the life story of Israeli spy Eli Cohen, who was stationed in Syria, managed to develop extremely close relations with Syrian politicians and military people, and then unfortunately ended up paying with his life after he was exposed and hanged. It's actually starring the British Jewish actor Sasha Baron Cohen, who essentially made a career for himself by portraying comedic characters such as Bora and Ali G. Yeah, it really surprised me to hear yeah. that he would be playing such a serious role, but yeah. he actually co-produced the series, so it makes sense right. 
Now, Eli Cohen is such a prominent part of Israeli history, so it's really interesting to, to me to hear that there are these critics from Israel who are saying that the series misconstrued all the events. Right. Well, first off, Eli Cohen's family is apparently not so happy about the series itself, saying that oh. the show portrays them in an unprivileged, so, lower oh. socioeconomic light, when in reality that wasn't the case. And in an interview with Cohen's daughter, Sophie Bendol, she mentioned that her mother, Cohen's wife, Nadia, who works as a seamstress for a wealthy Tel Aviv family on the series, was actually a nurse in real life. Wow. I don't. Why would they even do that? Like, exactly. It seems like an unnecessary change in yeah. terms of the plot. Right. And it was probably really difficult for the family to watch. Like, you know, well, yeah, I mean, they were, tr they were clearly trying to... Yeah, to uh, I don't know. To make it a Netflix they, yeah, series. Well, yeah, it exactly. makes people feel even worse for the family. You right, know? right, right. Sure, but I mean, it's I, hard, yeah, it's it's hard enough probably it was, for the Cohen family to kind of see these events on a Netflix show. It's probably It was definitely over-dramatizing well, at the, the same time. Also, the question is how, how much they actually um, you know, speak with the family while they're in, right. in the production of the film. She did, how they she, feel about she did changes, mention that they spoke to her um, a little after when they were already in connection with Netflix and they had some comments. But what's interesting, because you know, I just recently watched finished watching the show and was pretty impressed with it as a whole, other than the weird accents, like the fact that the Israeli and Arab yeah. characters are both yeah, speaking in English strange. with foreign accents and it just yeah. didn't really look or sound right. But actually some critics are saying that The Spy is a quote, classic Netflix series saying it lacks imagination and creativity. Others say that the writing done by Israeli producer Guy Diraf is clinging on to old spy cliches and then flattens its characters to straight boredom, making the show, you know, almost Predictable. Well, I've I've actually only just started the first episode, so I'm really struggling to get used to Sasha Baron Cohen as a serious character. You should definitely um, watch especially it, especially because his accent actually sounds like Borat. It's, it's really bad. confusing. Sorry, it really is. It yeah. I don't know. The I'm, a, I'm a bit further in, and I don't have a problem with his accent so much. I do. Uh, and again, you know, I totally understand the issues that the family might have, or other critics, you know, that they would be upset by the inaccuracies. But in and of itself, you know, the story so far from what I've seen, I think it's really enjoyable. Well, it's extremely yeah. for It's interesting. It's a crazy, yeah. crazy story. It's an right. Story. Well, that's. That's actually what, you know, uh, Cohen's daughter Sophie said. She understood that the show was, quote, based on a true story and sure. that, of course, making a show captivating, especially a Netflix one, the writer Guy Diraf, had to emphasize and really use his creative ability. But she continuously said how, you know, it was obviously strange to see her father's story pan out the way it did when the family knows the truth and so do other, you know, many Israelis. Yeah. However, of course, she was super thankful that his story was told to millions of people all over the world so that they could get to know him in the story. All right, well, yeah, I mean, I, I get that. I mean, um, I, I still want to finish this series. You have I heard, to. I, I think, heard a lot I think of positive things about yes. this, so yeah. everybody take this with a grain of salt yes. yeah. because I the mean, story is just so impressive. After talking about all yeah. this, this just made me want to finish the series even more, yeah. uh, and I'm sure a lot of other viewers are now interested in seeing it as well. Emmanuel, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, now here's a wild one. A case study was just released involving mm. details about a young man who's become legally blind and has lost his hearing due to a poor diet. Now get this, he eats only french fries, white bread, Ooh. processed ham, and Pringles. That's disgusting. It that's, is, That's honestly. really good. Like, okay, but what's, what's like a good diet then? The best diet. The best I'm, diet. I'm here with, with this scoop, all right? It seems that like everyone is really focused on the benefits of eating like an Israeli. Shocking, mm. huh? All right, well, yeah, I mean, that makes sense, because just within the last couple of days, reports from New York and Chicago detail the benefits of the Israeli diet. Food writers are actually even now highlighting how staple items of the Mediterranean cuisine are extremely mm -hmm. helpful, like, you know, olive oil, dates, lemons, schug, breakfast salads, trina, and chickpeas. So the most unusual one on that list, it might have caught your ear, is schug. It's a schug. Yeah, schug. How do we say it? Schug? schug? It's tough, guys. You don't have to pronounce it, but you should know that it's a green sauce that's basically filled with chopped hot chili peppers are commonly sold by private vendors in Israeli marketplaces, marketplaces like the Shuk. Um, and it's now also available on shelves in American supermarkets. Mm -hmm. Researchers from Quebec's Laval University say that eating spicy peppers can actual, actually help you satiate your appetite and prevent overeating, well, which is, is why perfect. I like eating spicy. Well, that's perfect for me, yeah, me too. Because as far as the Israeli salad goes, you know, it's a simple tossed of, you know, chopped cucumbers and tomatoes that... You know, it might be responsible for how everyone is sun-kissed but not burnt toast. Yeah. You know, tomatoes protect skin from sun damage as they well. They do, which is why I love cherry tomatoes. And restaurants in New York like Balabusta and La Malo, they tout dips, spreads, and everything that tastes Israeli. Um, Chasalon, which is another top spot, has also become so popular that food writers have tasted and wow. written about every item on that menu, and that <laughs> experience couldn't have been cheap. You know why, Aaron? No, absolutely. Yeah, well, yeah, because a small tomato dish goes for like twenty-four dollars there. <laughs> yeah, people, the Israelis are passionate about the tomato. We'll just put it that way. Yeah, but just check out Israeli Chef 
Eyal Shani. Yeah, I guess. But you know, New York isn't the only spot in Chicago. You also have Galit, another high-end Israeli restaurant pioneered by a chef who got his start making Israeli-flavored food in New Orleans. And to top it all off, you have Adina Sussman, originally from Los Angeles, uh, who just released a new Israeli cookbook called Sababa, which is getting attention on TV and the papers and on radio. So it makes you feel appreciative to live here, doesn't it, Aaron? It really does. Yeah. Well, really we, this does. is what we eat every day. I see you have that Israeli it's salad normal, every day. Pretty much everybody does. That's yeah. the thing to do. It's a fact. All right. Well, moving on. We hope you all eat healthy now. Hebrew University researchers are conducting an experiment to find out if they can use worms to preserve a woman's eggs. That's new. I, I've heard of freezing <laughs> your eggs, but like worms? Just... Yes. Well, to give more details on the story, we brought in more of an expert, our ILTV correspondent, Shanna Fold. I really don't know all the details yeah. on this. So, Shanna, thank you for joining Please us. Take it away. You're welcome. So, Hebrew University researchers are also teaming up with scientists from Harvard to tackle this one. They are testing out the process on worms. Okay. So basically, worms actually have 20,000 of the same genes as humans do. So they're a good organism to work with. Interesting. I did not know that. <laughs> Fun fact for the crowd. Yeah. So basically, they are checking the gene in the egg that matures it. Okay. So basically, mm -hmm. they're trying to see if they can slow down the maturation process for women, if they could locate the gene and manipulate it in worms. Okay, so this is basically how a test to see if we can actually stop the biological clock, sure. right, from ticking. All right, so so what is this is obviously a big study. What is the the main goal beyond just that? So Natasha, I'm sure that you understand. Maybe not you, Aaron. Sorry, but women <laughs> I can't have, have worms. <laughs> well, you don't have eggs. Uh -huh. You, you, don't, have you eggs. don't have eggs. You might have worms. <laughs> you might have worms. Teach their own. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> Women have a lot to do yeah. before, you know, they hit the age of 30, and by 35, um, it's already more difficult for mm -hmm. women to have successful births. So the idea is that if they yeah. could locate the gene and manipulate it to slow down and preserve your eggs, they can kind of keep the eggs from uh, maturing too fast. Right. So mm -hmm. that your eggs that might be good at 22 to 27 to 30, are still the same when you're 35 Keeps them, like, to 40. Fresh, so to speak. Yeah, I love how Aaron's I'm like writing this down. I'm just trying, I'm I'm trying to take notes. <laughs> well, this is okay. This is really, really interesting. So you're basically saying that this process could help every Israeli and Jewish woman, I would say, in the world from I dealing with their mother yeah. who is stressing them out about having babies <laughs> earlier true. than later. Well, I would say, but it's, it's not just Jewish moms because in yeah. the U.S., the uh, women are starting to have their first kid at the age of 26. And in Japan and some more Nordic countries, women aren't having their first child until 31. Right. So, you know, we're not the only ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, if, I mean, I think it's a fact that more women are choosing to have babies later nowadays because we have careers. Yeah, we have, the culture is changing. Yeah. The times are changing. We have other and, things and to do. That's totally reasonable. Shana, right. thank, thank you, you so much, much for joining us. Really no interesting. I hope you wrote that down, Aaron. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Now, just days ago on ILTV, we saw the Israel national baseball team pack up their bags and head out of town to take on the European Baseball Championships in Bonn, Germany. And while we have a very positive update, the team is advancing towards the Olympic qualifier. Yep, it's so exciting. We here in the newsroom were happy to find out that the team uh, beat the Czech Republic over the weekend in its first game, six to one, and then took the win during a game with Sweden. They won there four to three. This is a big deal it's, for it's Israel. It's huge. No, the team is getting recognition now for having an excellent pitching staff and for powering through the rain during their first game on European turf. And here's what infielder Asaf Loengart had to say about the win. איש מעולה, מתרגש מאוד לקראת המשחק הקרוב. כולנו פה למען מטרה אחת, מוכנים לשחק, לנצח, להגיע לאולימפיאדה, לעשות כבוד לישראל. So now Israel must face Germany and Great Britain over the next few days, and if the team can manage to hang on as one of the top five in Bonn, then they can advance to the WBSC Olympic Qualifier Europe Africa Tournament, which takes place in Parma, Italy, and begins on September 18th. And finally, if Israel can place number one while in Italy, then they qualify for next summer's Olympics in Tokyo. Well, if they make it, I hope the boys are going to be able to focus on actually playing ball and not just eating pasta. They're going to Italy, Germany. It Good looks luck. like they have, you know... Yeah. A, a, very carby places to visit. Very carby places to visit. But we are, we have our fingers crossed for them. We hope you win. All right, now, let's take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be partly cloudy and warm with a low of 76 or 24 degrees Celsius. And then tomorrow you can expect very little change and a high of 86 
or 30 degrees Celsius. And that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.54 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook and follow us on Instagram. I'm Aaron Porras. And I'm Natasha Kierczek. Thanks so much for watching.